Good morning, friends, and happy Sabbath. I'm very happy to be here with you on Sam TV and this worship service. Before we begin our sermon today, I would like you to uh, pray with me as we seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're trying heaven. I kneel before you at this time because I realize that without you, I am nothing. I want you to speak through me, Lord, and that this sermon that you put in my heart today to share with your people may reach their hearts that we may see that there is hope even when we struggle with our temper, that there is hope, Lord, that you can give us the victory and that we can be like Jesus. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I want to talk to you today about a very practical sermon, a very practical topic. And it's something that we all have at some point in our lives, and maybe perhaps every day or every week, we have struggled with, and that has to do with anger. Have you ever gotten angry? Oh, perhaps that's not your case because you're already a Christian. Oh, but sometimes we, even being Christians, we get angry, right? We get on people's nerves sometimes, or they get on our nerves. In fact, in church life, sometimes we get angry at other people because they don't see things the way we do see them. Regardless of the reasons why you get angry, I want to present to you the hope as it is in Jesus Christ, that even angry people can be saved. There are situations that really drive us crazy. Yes, but the serious thing is when they lead us to violent actions. Anger is destructive and causes tragedies. It destroys love and family relationships, and it sets people against each other, which goes contrary to the prayer of Jesus Christ in John 17 about the unity of the church. Those who suffer from successive fits of anger suffer from an internal explosive disorder. That's how they call it today. Well, what is anger then? Anger is an emotional state of varying intensity from mild irritation to violent fury. Like other emotions, it is accompanied by bodily changes, such as an increase in adrenaline levels and acceleration of the heartbeat. What are some of the causes of anger? Well, it could be anguish, anxiety, constant dissatisfaction, negative mood, but the root of it all is separation from Christ. I like this phrase about anger, and it says, attacking another person is like throwing cacti with your bare hands without any protection. The other person will get hurt, but so will you. Few people really realize that when you give expression to your anger, when you want to defend yourself and vindicate what you think is right, you do not realize that you're also hurting yourself. Perhaps I'm talking with someone who's struggling with this and I can ask you this question. Are you happy with your temper, with your angry temper? Do you think that is really makes you feel good? I think we will all agree that that is not a good thing. But yet, when moment comes, uh, moments of irritation, we yield very easily to that. And we know the Lord, we love the Lord, we want to do the things that are right. But when we see those expressions of anger in our lives, we feel discouraged. The enemy comes and tempts us and makes us believe that we are just hypocrites, that there is no hope for us. How could I, as a Christian, get angry? Why, why did I say those things? I was not supposed to say it like that. And then we get discouraged and our faith weakens. But today, my dear friends, I want to share some hope with you. There is hope even to those who are cruel, violent, and angry people. There is a verse in the Bible First, I want to show how the Bible describes anger. Proverbs 21, 19. 
Proverbs 21, 19. Now, I don't want to be chauvinist as I read this because this is how the Bible says, but I would apply this verse to both genders. But it says here in Proverbs 21, verse 19, better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. Wow, that is serious, right? Again, I said, I don't think this only applies to angry wives, but this would also apply to angry husbands. But here, Solomon is clearly saying and is clearly showing that angry disposition is so terrible that he would prefer to dwell in the wilderness that with a contentious and angry person. Let's see what Proverbs 29, 11 says. A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. So the Bible says that whoever vents all his feelings, you know, some people are very proud of their frankness. They say, well, I just say the things as the way they come to my mind. I say things as they are. But not always being frank like that is actually godly. Yes, there are certain moments where you have to say things. But it's not, it's not what you say. It's how you say them. Here, the Bible, it says, is the one that vents all his feelings is a fool, but the wise man holds them back. Also, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 16. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 16. It says, a fool's wrath is known at once, but a prudent man covers shame. So, you realize someone who struggles with temper when they just explode very easily because it says here that the fool's uh, man is known by his wrath. He uncovers it very easily. Uh, also, let's go to the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. The Apostle Paul has a few things to say about this. Actually, the Bible has plenty of counsel. We are not going to go through all the verses, but... We just wanted to have an idea of what the Bible says on this. Uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. God wants us to put away all these things because these are our influence. This affects us. This hurts us. And we also hurt other people. Today... As an illustration, I want to study the lives of two men in the Bible who struggle with wrath. One, actually both of them, eventually overcame, but their story is very painful. And we will see how, because of their temper, they hurt a lot of people. But in the end, they were saved. And I'm going to talk about two brothers, Simeon and Levi. Simeon and Levi. Let's talk about Simeon first. Why am I talking about them together? Because Jacob, their father, when he was about to die, he started to describe the character of his sons and pronounce a blessing on them. When it comes to Simeon, he mentions Simeon and Levi together, and he calls them uh, sons of cruelty. So we're going to study their lives we're going to see where they failed and how they overcame. So let's go to Simeon first. Let's go to Genesis 29, verse 33. Genesis 29 and verse 33. Simeon was the second son of Leah. And the Bible says here, when Leah gave birth to Simeon, uh, this is what the Bible uh, says. Genesis 29 and verse 33. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And, he, and she called his name Simeon. So notice that the reason why she gives his na this name to him is because the Lord heard her prayer that she was not loved. Simeon means God hears me. comes from the root Shema, which is the verb to hear, 
in Hebrew. It's a beautiful name. So Simeon was born with, a, or he was given a beautiful name at his birth. And this was the kind of character that his mom wanted to see reproduced in him. But when we study his life, we're going to realize that his actions, his character is contrary to this. He's vindictive. He's licentious. He's uh, cruel. He is wrathful. And let us go then to a few stories in the Bible that illustrates the character of Simeon and also Levi. Let's go to Genesis 34. Genesis 34, we'll spend a um, good part of our message today in Genesis 34. And this is a very interesting incident. Here Jacob is in Canaan and he is returning back home, but something very unusual and very tragic happens in his home. One of his daughters, Dinah, she is raped by one of the men of the land. And we read here in verse 1, Genesis 34 verses 1 through 3. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamer, the Hebite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. His soul was strongly attached to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. So try to think of this. Here is a man who is a pagan, and now he forces this woman to sleep with him. This woman, the daughter of Jacob, it says that she went to wander to see the daughters of the land. So we could say that she exposed her, herself to temptation and danger, but this doesn't justify the action of Shechem, who raped her. But here's the point. So this news comes to the family. And try to think, try to put yourself on, on Jacob's shoes and or uh, Dinah's brother's shoes. Here, Dinah has been disgraced. How would you feel? If you were Dinah's father, how would you feel? Would you be just like, oh, you know, poor man, maybe it wasn't his fault. He was just in a weakness and he, he, he was weak that day. He didn't have enough self-control, but that's fine. Is that the way you would respond? I mean, I have a little daughter. She is 10 months old and I can just, I cannot think how I would react if someone would do that to my daughter, okay? Would that be enough reason to be angry? I think so. I'm speaking as a human, all right? But we're going to see the development of certain things here that actually grieved Jacob very much, deeply. So Shechem fell in love with Dinah. He tells his dad about it. And now they, they come to the family of Jacob. Let's go to verse 7. They come there. They want this a lady, young lady, to marry Shechem. Verse 7, it says, And the sons of Jacob came in in the field. When they heard it, the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by laying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. So they were what when they heard the news? Her brothers were angry. Is this a good anger or is this a bad one? Because by the way, I didn't mention this in the introduction, but not all anger is bad. You're, you're going to say like, what, really? Yeah, not all anger is bad. There is something called righteous anger, righteous indignation. And that's what Paul means in Ephesians 4.29 when he says, be angry and sin not. Those two things sound contradictory. How could you be angry and sin not? Is it possible to be angry without sinning? Yes, it is. And I'll give you a few examples shortly with Levi. So hold that thought for a moment. But for now, just uh, think about this. It is, there, it is possible in certain situations to be angry and not sin. So I don't think 
when the brothers heard this and they were angry, I don't think they're sinning in this moment, okay? I mean, this is just the natural response to human cruelty. I mean, I'm going to be angry with a guy who disgraces my daughter. I'm going to be angry with someone who is insulting my wife and abusing her. And that doesn't mean I am not a Christian. It just means that I, I am displeased with such sinful and wicked behavior that I cannot tolerate. And that, my dear brothers and sisters, that is right. Actually, the Bible speaks of God who also gets angry. Huh. God gets angry? Yes. The Bible speaks about the wrath of God, of course. He doesn't get angry as we do. But his anger is displeasure and disgust for human wickedness, for bad actions that cause him so much pain and also to other people. So the brothers get angry. They're displeased with this. But now Shechem and Hamer, his father, they propose something to Jacob and his sons. Let's go to verses 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10 of Genesis uh, 34. It says, make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters to yourselves. So you shall dwell with us and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it and acquire possessions for yourselves and it. Now, what problem do, do you find with this solution? Oh, there is a big problem here. This solution is actually threatening the covenant promises that God had promised to Abraham. They were not supposed to mingle with the people of the land. This would just open up so many doors of temptation. And not only that, but the seed of the Messiah will be threatened to disappear because now there will not be holy line. The only holy lineage that was existed was the family of Jacob. But if they would intermingle with the people of the land, then it would disappear. So we're finding here that the same promise that had been given to Abraham is repeated under wrong conditions in verse 10. It says, you shall dwell with us. The land shall be before you. Okay. So, two of Jacob's brothers, Simeon and Levi, they propose something very interesting. Uh, because of time, we're, I'm not going to read all the verses but let's just read a few of them so that we can have an idea of their proposal. Let's go to verse 13. Verse 13. It says, But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor. And we're going to realize that this is actually Simeon and Levi. They answer Jacob, uh, 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 they answer Shechem and Hamor, his father, and spoke deceitfully. And that's where the problem begins, okay? So it's okay to be angry at wrong acts, but don't use deception to take vengeance, all right? So it, they spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. And they said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised. For that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition, we will consent to you. If you will become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our, daughter to, our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you will not heed us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone. Now, this was such an interesting condition. Just think about this. In those days, you know, circumcision was, was looked upon by the pagans as something gross. Um, how, would you, how are you going to do that? That is gross. But 
Shechem was so much in love with this woman, with this young lady, that he says, yes, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to be circumcised without anesthesia, just like that. And all the men of the city saw Shechem and Hamer, his father, come back, return to the city. They spoke with, speak with all the males and says, yes, you know what? We're going to make a covenant with these people, the sons of Jacob. But uh, the only condition is we need to circumcise. We need to circumcise. But what happened? Why, is it, why does the Bible say that they spoke these words deceitfully? Well, all the men of the city were circumcised. And then it says here in verse 25, verse 25 all the way through verse 29. It says, now it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain. So this was the worst day, the most painful day after circumcision. That two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. And they killed Hamer and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon this lane and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their oxen, their donkeys, what was in their city and what was in the field. And all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, they took captive. And they plundered even all that was in the houses. Now perhaps here you, who is a, fa who is a father, whose daughter has been disgraced, as you read this story, perhaps you might be agreeing with Simeon and Levi and say, that's right, that's what they deserve, right? Let me ask you this. Was what Shechem did to Leah, was that bad? Yes, it was very, very bad. Is it justifiable for Simeon and Levi to have responded with deceit violence, cruelty, and death. Is it justifiable? Was that their part? Not, it was not. You know, anger is like an anesthesia sometimes. It blinds, it blocks our sensitivities so that we do under the effects of anger, we do things that we would never do if we had a calm mind. You know, some people, after they come down, but they have killed or, or they have injured someone, after they come down, they look by it and say, how could I have done this? Yes, that's how anger is. I cannot explain all the chemical effects in your blood, the hormones, all that adrenaline, but it blinds your judgment. And it lets down the barriers of self-control so that you cannot think clearly for yourself. How did Jacob react to this? Genesis 34, verses 30 through 31. It says here, Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I am few number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? Their anger and their displeasure for this action was right. But the way they took the reign and the vengeance into their own hands was wrong. You're, my, my friend, you're not supposed to take vengeance. You can use whatever is rightful in your hand to make sure that that person is being punished. You can do that. You can, you can sue the person, and there is nothing wrong with suing someone who has committed a crime that has attempted against the life and integrity of someone. It's not unchristian to do that, yes. You can do that. You can do what is lawful, what, what is within in your hands, so that that person can pay for the, what the person did. Of course, you need to forgive the person in your heart. If you're doing this out of just resentment and vengeance, no, that's not right. But at the same time, I mean, 
I, I don't want a pedophile to be free and just hurting other children. Do you, do you see what I mean? Okay? That person needs to be in jail to protect other children. Not necessarily because he did it to me. Yes, that's for that too. But you should have a spirit of forgiveness. But when you go and you take these things into your own hands, then you're committing sin. And now you're becoming as guilty as the other person. That's why Jacob, as I said, in Genesis 49, let's go there, Genesis 49, Jacob was about to die, and he's pronouncing blessings and curses over his children. And speaking of Simeon and Levi, this is what Jacob said. Genesis 49, verses 5 through 7. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their counsel. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Curse be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob, and scatter them in Israel. It's interesting that with Simeon, as we're going to see, he ends up separating from the tribes. He will be scattered from his brother. Jacob is cursing their anger and their, and, and their fierceness, their wrath and their cruelty. It's interesting here in verse 6 that he calls them self-willed. Yes, angry manifestations are just an expression of self-will, of selfishness, if you will. Later, we find about Simeon again in Genesis chapter 32. You know that, uh, actually 42, Genesis 42. You know that when Joseph was sold as a slave by his brethren, do you know who was the leader and the instigator, the main instigator into that plan and plot? It was Simeon. And this is why in Genesis 42, uh, verse 24, when the brethren come to Joseph to buy food from him, Joseph starts testing them, asking them questions about their brother and their father, their youngest brother, Benjamin. And here, when they finally return, it says in verse 24, and he turned himself away from them and wept. Then he turned to them again and talked with them, and he took Simeon from them and bowed, bound him before their eyes. Verse uh, 36 of the same chapter. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin. All these things are against me. Now, this is beautiful because, you see, Jacob loved ben uh, Simeon, even though he was like that. He loved Simeon. Jacob was sad now because Simeon was left in prison in Egypt. Now, why did Joseph imprison Simeon? Why not Judah? Why not Reuben or the other brethren? Because Simeon was the instigator of that plot. Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, in, the, in the cruel dealing toward their brother, Simeon had been the instigator and protagonist. And for this reason, the choice fell on him to remain in prison. Now, was Joseph taking vengeance by himself? Why did he do this? Well, apparently, as we read the story, we, we could come to that conclusion. Well, Joseph must be thinking, you were the one that, that, uh, whose idea was for me to be sold. Now you're going to pay for what you did. But I, I don't think that was Joseph's motivation. We see throughout the whole story that Joseph is actually trying to test them and see if they had changed or if they were the same. So Joseph actually, what he's doing with his brother is redemptive. And he's treating them with love. So notice the difference. Yes, you do not, you do not condone sin. You do not condone what is wrong. But at the same time, you treat with love that person. And you try to help that person as Joseph was trying to help his brothers that acted 
angrily against him. This is a very good example. Now, one more thing about Simeon. When we read in the book of Numbers, you know, this, of course, is no longer Simeon as a person, but the tribe of Simeon. That actually we find in the tribes a reflection of the character of the 12 patriarchs. In the book of Numbers, those that left from Egypt of the tribe of Simeon, in Numbers chapter 1 and verse 23, the Bible says, those who were number of the tribe of Simeon were 59,300. They were males 20 years and older of the tribe of Simeon. Notice, a big number, 59,300. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because when we go to the second census that we find in the book of Numbers, this is when they leave you know, Sinai, those who had left Egypt. And now when we go to the second census in Numbers 26, let's go to Numbers chapter 26, verses 12 through 14. We find a very diminished number. It says in, in, in Numbers 26, verses 12 through 14, the sons of Simeon, according to their families, were Nemuel, the family of the Nemulites, and Jamin, I'm going to skip some of these names. I'm interested in the number. Verse 14. Verse 14 says, These are the families of the Simeonites. 22,200. So, notice, when they leave Egypt, they're 59,300. Now, when they're about to enter Canaan, cross the Jordan, they're 22,200. Now, if you read the whole chapter and you make the comparisons between the two census, you're going to notice that most of the tribes are, have grown. A few tribes have actually less people, but it's not very significant. But with Simeon, it's very significant. Uh, it is as if the tribe ha had almost disappeared. Why? Well, because of what happened in Numbers 25. In Numbers 25, we have the apostasy of Baal Peor, where they were encamped in the borders of Jordan. And now the Midianites, these women come into the camp and the, ch the children of Israel start committing adultery and idolatry with them. You know what was the leading tribe into all this apostasy? In Numbers 25 verse 14, it says that uh, it was Simeon. Now the name of the Israelite who was killed, who was killed with the Midianite woman was Zimri, the son of Salu, a leader of a father's house among the Simeonites. They almost end up without a, tri without a tribe. They, the tribe was greatly diminished. The slaughter that happened there, uh, of course, many of the tribes participated in this, but it was mainly Simeon, the tribe of Simeon. Because of this, they were not given uh, a portion when the land was divided, but they had to share their portion because they were not big enough with with the tribe of Judah. We're going to leave it there. So can cruelty, can licentiousness, can anger, bad temper, can this lead to very sad um, consequences? Yes, it can. And not only in your life. Because here we see that this can even transcend to your children and your children's children to future generations. But the beautiful thing is, even though we do not know Simeon as a person, what happened to him, but we do, not, we do know that eventually Simeon will be saved. How do I know this? How do I know this? Well, when we go to Revelation, Revelation 21 and verse 12. Revelation 21, verse 12. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense for God to write the name of the 12 tribes of Israel, including Simeon and Levi. It would make any sense if they were not going to be there. Okay? Revelation 21 and verse 12. It says, And so she had gray high wall with 12 gates. This is talking about the New Jerusalem. And 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And I know the tribe of Simeon. 
and I know the tribe of Levi are here as well. So Simeon eventually and all the brethren of Joseph, they repented. Their lives were transformed. Life taught them that that's not the way you do things, that the way of righteousness is humility, justice, meekness. Now let's go to Levi, because Levi, with Simeon, we don't see the contrast very clear, but with Levi, we do. Levi was the third son of Leah. And now let's go back to Genesis. Genesis 29 and verse 34. What does the name Levi mean? Genesis 29 and verse 34. And this is what the Bible says. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. Levi actually means attached to me or uh, united to me, linked to me. So the character of Levi, as we read in the Bible, he was also revengeful. He was wrathful. But he was someone who was willing to be taught. He was someone who was inclined to spiritual things. He shared, as we read the story with Simeon, the slaughter of Shechem. We see in him wrath, self-will also manifested. Call, uh, their father Jacob calls him instrument of cruelty. But Levi played a very important role. When Israel committed apostasy at Sinai with the golden calf. Let's go there in Exodus. The book of Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32 verses 26 through 28. And now here we're going to see how anger, when it is sanctified, can actually serve good purposes. Exodus 32, verse 26 through 28. 26 through 28. This is what the Bible says. Then Moses, remember, uh, Moses comes down from the mount. All the people are committing apostasy. And Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side, and go in and out from the entrance to entrance throughout the camp, and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Wow. You know, you read these stories, and I don't, you know, my purpose here is not to explain why God would command people to slaughter other people. There is a whole, a whole study on this. Actually, I preached this sermon here some time ago about theodicy, why God... You know, vindication of, of God in the Old Testament, of the existence of evil and, and God punishing and all these things. We already talked about that. But the point here is that this sounds very similar to what Simeon and Levi did with the Shechemites, right? They just took out their sword. They just killed mercilessly. I mean, I mean, you need to have some... some uh, guts to be able to do these things, right? But why is it that is justified here in Exodus 34, but is not justified in Genesis, Exodus 32 actually, but is not justified in Genesis 34? What is the difference? When in, Ex in Genesis 34, God did not command them to take vengeance on these people. This was not a command from God. Number two, they were acting deceitfully. They made this man believe that they wanted to make a covenant with them and had them be circumcised so that they could be in pain and not defend themselves. Even if it is your enemy, that is unfair. And number three, they took vengeance into their own hands. That means they were playing God because the Bible says that vengeance only belongs to God. Exodus 32, what is the difference? 
Now, God has just recently established them as a theodicy, a nation governed by God. Therefore, God could command certain things, pass certain laws, because Israel as a theodicy was a civil and also religious entity. So the, the church and the state were together, okay? And God could, through Moses, who was the legislator, God could pass certain laws to be carried out. So Moses speaking on behalf of God, and this is actually to vindicate God. This is a wrath that is righteous. And the same story, we see Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of, of stone with the commandments of God. When he sees this apostasy, the Bible says that Moses just throws and he breaks those tables of stone. And now he grinds that golden calf. And he throws that into the water and makes the children of Israel drink from that spring with the grind, grinded golden calf. Some people would say, whoa, Moses lost it. He just lost it. Did he? You know, when we look at that story, we would think of Aaron as, oh, the patient guy. You know, he was so patient. He was just... Lord, don't get angry at the people. But we see Moses, he's just acting so, so ruthlessly. But what Moses was experiencing in this story, who was actually a Levite as well, was righteous indignation. Do you remember a time when Jesus came into the temple? And he saw the priest and all these people, they were just trading with the Lord's money. And they were just having all these tables in the temple and selling the sacrifices in a very uh, noisy way inside the temple. It says that Jesus, it says that Jesus uh, threw down their, their, their tables and he, he, he rebuked them in the name of the Lord. Someone would say, wow, Jesus lost it. He lost his patience. He did not. Because the Bible says he never sinned. That is righteous indignation. Now, don't use this as an excuse to always get angry and say, well, oh, this is righteous indignation. No. Okay? What is righteous indignation? It's when you see that the name of God, his cause, his church are being mistreated, are being reproached. And you, because you have a sense of justice, that upsets you. You don't feel good about that. You, in, in, even you, you pronounce your disapproval of such things. That is not getting angry. That is righteous indignation. You know, the example of Levi is a good example of someone who may have a bad temper, but when that person allows the Holy Spirit to work in his or her life, God can use you as an instrument of righteousness. Yes, my dear friends, there is hope. You know, because of this act, Levi became the priestly tribe, the priestly tribe. God appointed the Levites to be the priest in Exodus 32. Um, uh, we read that uh, God appoints Levi to be the tribe for them. Uh, later on, we read, we're going to skip that reference here. Later on, we read in Deuteronomy. Chapter 33, verses 8 through 11. Deuteronomy chapter uh, 33, verses 8 through 11. Moses, again, he does something similar to what Jacob was doing before he died. And he is pronouncing blessings on the tribes. Speaking of Levi, it says, And Levi, and of Levi, he said, Let your Thummim and Urim be with your Holy One, whom you tested at Massa, and with whom you contended at the waters of Meribah who says of his father and mother, I have not seen them, nor did he acknowledge his brothers or know his own children, for they have observed your, your word and kept your 
covenant. Verse 10, they shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your law. They shall put incense before you and a whole burnt sacrifice on your altar. The tribe of Levi became the teachers of righteousness in Israel. They became the priestly tribe. They became the priestly tribe. So how to overcome anger then? What do we learn from these two stories, Simeon and Levi? We learn first that the way of righteousness is not the way of wrath. You are not supposed to take what the Lord does in your hands. When cruel things happen before you, when people mistreat you, leave that in the hands of the Lord. Yes, you're a human being. You're going to feel hurt. But don't take this into your own hands. Let the Lord work. Number two, that even if you are, if you struggle with your temper, know that there is hope for you. God can use you. God can sanctify your temper. And God can use you before, as you, before you were an, an instrument of cruelty like Levi, but now you're an instrument of righteousness the new Levi that was transformed by the grace of God. God doesn't want us to hurt others, to be always, all the time, just, just losing our patience and just hurting other people and hurting ourselves. In the last days, in the book of Revelation, we find, let's go to Revelation chapter uh, 7. And verse 7, the book of Revelation, we find a remnant that is called by number the 144,000. Now, I believe this is my personal conviction. I believe that the, the 144,000 are not a literal number. This is a spiritual symbolic number. But the reason why the tribes are mentioned here is not because we have the tribes today, but because... Today, God's people, to some extent, represent the different personalities that we have in the sons of Jacob. Yes, some of us are like Levi and Simeon. We, we just lose our temper so easily. We get angry so many times. I always, I, we're always in trouble with people in the church. People in the church don't want to work with us. But you know what? Among the 144,000, there will be many people like that, but who will be washed by the blood of the Lamb. Here in Revelation chapter 7, verse 7, it says of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed, and of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Oh, my friends, among the 144,000, there are going to be spiritual Levites and spiritual Simeonites who had been sanctified and washed by the blood of the Lamb. Actually, John sees the same group. I believe the, the great multitude and 144,000 are the same group. And it says here in verse 9 of the same chapter, After these things I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. How are they clothed? With white robes. What, what do white robes represent? They represent, according to Revelation 19, they represent the righteousness of the saints, which is not their own righteousness. It is the righteousness of Jesus. The righteousness of Jesus. Okay, this is Revelation 19, verse 8. It's the righteousness of Jesus. So, you know, when, whenever we're not connected with Christ, when we're not clothed with His righteousness, then believe me, you're going to be an easy prey to fall into temptation, especially to give vent to your feelings, to get angry easily. It is only by the grace of God, by the righteousness of Jesus, the imputed and imparted righteousness of Jesus, that you can have self-control, that you can control your temper and not hurt others and not give expression to it. They're clothed in white linen. But I also like 
what it says here in verse 14 of the same chapter, Revelation 7, 14. And I said to him, sir, you know, so he said to me, these are the ones who, who, who come out of the great tribulation and wash their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Yes, you can go to therapy. Yes, you can do many things. You can go to counseling. You can go to your pastor for him to pray with you. You can read the Bible, but know this. Nothing will have the same effect. Nothing will give you victory as the blood of the Lamb. Your, your robes might be stained with the sin of anger, the sin of impatience, the sin of wrath, of revenge. But there is hope for you. The Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He has the remedy for you to control your temper. He can make you white, whiter than snow. I want to be closing here with uh, the words of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. The Bible says, be angry and do not sin. We already explained what that is. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. If you, for some reason, you get angry, you lose your temper, you lose your patience with your wife, with your spouse, with your children, if you want to prevent further damage, Reconcile with that person before the sun goes down. In that way, you're defeating the devil and you're stabbing your own self-will. Yes, I fail, but here I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to recognize that it was my fault. And by the grace of God, I want to reconcile with you. I don't want to do it again. Do not give place to evil. The Bible says, is that your desire? Perhaps I'm talking with someone here who, who really is struggling with this for many years. I know, I know many people, Christians, Seventh-day Adventists, who struggle with this. I've seen them even trembling when they get angry and they say, I don't want to feel like this, but I'm just feeling it. It's just coming out without control. I want to tell you, my friend, that I want to pray for you at this time. I want to assure you that you don't have to be slave of your feelings anymore. I want to assure you that when you humbly repent before God, God can give you the victory over that. When you humbly ask God, when you recognize that it is not you to defend yourself, because when you try to defend yourself, you're putting yourself in the place of God. Like Simon, Simeon and Levi. No. Let God be God. Let him take your cause. You just humble yourself. Even when other people are doing unfair things to you, still leave this in the hands of the Lord. Do what is in your part to do. Always have a forgiving spirit. And let God melt your heart and soften it so that you may give glory to him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're trying heaven. I want to lift up those those of your children, Lord, who are struggling with this, I know that there are many people, there are many people in our church that struggle with wrath, with anger. And sometimes, Lord, we have enough reasons to be angry. We see wrong things around us, things that really are not good. We, we, we see other people speaking bad things about us. Sometimes we see, Lord, that those whom we love have betrayed us. Our dear ones, Lord, have been abused. But Lord, we want to leave all these things in your hands. We pray that you may give us a forgiving spirit and that you may wash us in the blood of the Lamb. We realize that only Jesus is our only hope. So I leave your children in your hands. Sanctify them through thy truth. And make us, Lord, jewels. Make us precious jewels 
in you. I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.